In this video, you will see the rescue of two Golden Globe sailors racing around the world solo, whose boats were dismasted by a 70-knot storm and 15-meter seas. In the middle of the Southern Ocean, one of the sailors, Commander Abolash Tommy of the Indian Navy, was badly injured and unable to sail further at rescue. In an update on his condition and their plans to recover the boats. Stay tuned all the way to the end for a bonus interview with 2018 Golden Globe Race founder Don McIntyre. Subscribe to Slow Boat Sailing to get ripped from the headlines stories about the most interesting sailors in the world. On Friday, September 21st, 2018, Avalish Tommy and Gregor McCutcheon were in third and fourth place of the Golden Globe race when they hit a 70-knot storm with 15-meter waves that rolled both their boats and dismasted them. Tommy suffered a severe back injury and could not do basic tasks, including eat or drink or close his companionway hatch and eventually signaled for rescue that set off an international rescue coordinated by the Australian Maritime Safety Authority, AMSA, the Royal Australian Air Force P-8A Poseidon aircraft, and a civilian Global Express aircraft from Australia were sent. The Indians sent a Navy P-8I aircraft out of Mauritius. The closest vessel that could assist was the fishing patrol vessel vessel Osiris, which arrived early in the morning of Monday, September 24th. Fellow Golden Globe racer Gregor McCutcheon was able to set up a jury rig, but his progress was too slow to intercept Abolash Tommy, who was suffering from a severe back injury prior to the arrival of FPV Osiris, a French flag vessel. Osiris took Tommy out of his stricken yacht in a Zodiac and then rescued Irish sailor Gregor McCutcheon from his dismasted vessel on the same day. Both men were taken to the Ill Amsterdam where Tommy received medical treatment and no broken bones were found, but it was days before he could even stand. Tommy was rescued as his YB3 satellite communicator was running out of batteries, and it was his only link to the outside world. Tommy said the sea was unbelievably rough. Me and my boat, Thuria, were pitched against the nature's might. I survived because of my sailing skills, the soldier bit in me, and my naval training cut in for that fight. Very thankful to the Indian Navy, all who rescued me. Tommy's boat was not scuttled because Captain Donde, Tommy's manager, had plans to salvage his yacht, Thuria. The Indian Navy plans to tow Thuria to St. Paul's Island, some 40 miles to the north, and leave crew to make repairs and sail her to land. Irish sailors McGuckin's yacht, Hanley Energy Endurance, was also left drifting when the Osiris crew picked him off the yacht. In a statement, Lo Hagen, the spokesman for Team Ireland, said, During the controlled evacuation, of Hanley Energy Endurance, McGuckin was instructed to leave the vessel afloat. The French fisheries patrol vessel Osiris instructed McGuckin that scuttling the vessel would be in breach of international maritime regulations. Hence, McGuckin removed all debris from the deck that could become separated, secured all equipment on board, and ensured the AIS beacon was active. The power source to the AIS device is solar panels, which should remain active without any outside assistance reducing the risk to other vessels. Precautionary steps were also taken to ensure the relatively small amount of fuel on board was secure. The Indian Navy plans to use the frigate Ines Satpura to transport Tommy to India. This may include an airlift from the Amsterdam island. The Australian Navy plans to take McGuckin to Australia via the HMS Ballarat. It's a great relief to know that Commander Tommy and Gregor McGuckin will survive their bout with the fierce Southern Ocean storm. What's the latest on uh, Tom or Tommy's uh, health? Uh, yeah, he's uh, actually good. He, uh, we just heard a few hours ago he's now standing up. He stood up, didn't walk around, but they got him vertical. And uh, he's on total relaxation stuff, total rest. So they're just, he's got to do everything through a straw, you know, 
Um, he's got no broken bones. Everything that every injury he's got at the moment will fully recover. So he's gonna. It'll take a while, but it'll be right. It's all muscles and tendons and stuff and or whatever. Um, and he's still. He's in the hospital. Um, he is uh, going to be evacuated from there tomorrow. Um, and. Uh, HMAS Ballarat is due to arrive first light tomorrow and as soon as they're within helicopter range they're going to fly in, pick up Gregory and Tommy, bring them back to the ship and then head to uh, Fremantle uh, in Perth, you know, and they're due there somewhere around the 2nd or 3rd of uh, October. So, um, and the boat, uh, there's still a plan by the Indian Navy to uh, try and recover the boat. Uh, they... Um, uh, they're at this stage, I believe, it's not official yet, but we're hearing that they're maybe intending to uh, tow it to uh, St. Paul Island, get it inside the anchorage there, and uh, strap it tight ashore and everything, and then look at ways of uh, making it sailable and then sail it somewhere. They don't have a derrick big enough to pull it onto the ship, but they the indications are they would like to salvage the boat. Okay, that, that makes sense. It's a, it is a new boat. <laughs> yeah, well, it's and it, history. it is you know, the Indian Navy's boat too, right? They, they're the owners of the boat. Uh, no, I'm not sure about that. I don't think so. Um, in Tommy's first uh, solo circumnavigation, that was an Indian expedition, Indian-owned boat that's gone on to do other, just went round the world with six female Indian sailors on board and, and so on. But this one is not owned by the Indian Navy, I believe. I'm not sure exactly who owned it, but the Indian Navy is supporting Tommy in this uh, adventure, uh, but it's not fully sponsored by the Indian Navy. Uh, but he is a serving commander in the Indian Navy. He's a, uh, a commander. He's a, a, He flies surveillance aircraft, and uh, uh, he's been in the Navy for a long time. You know. So what is... Uh what was the thoughts for Gregor when he was decide uh, Gregor McCucken, uh when he was deciding about to abandon ship? Uh, did he consider doing what the Indian Navy is doing? No, no, he he preferred to scuttle the boat. Uh, but uh, the reality was that uh, he was notified by the captain of the Osiris, the French fisheries surveillance vessel that it was actually illegal to do that in that particular zone. Uh, it's a sensitive maritime park. Uh, so he, under instruction, he then had to secure everything on deck and uh, uh, make sure it was all stowed down below, um, try and secure the fuel that's on board in containers down below, uh, make sure the solar-powered AIS was fully operational uh, to keep any ships away from it. And uh, we've maintained the tracker as well. We control the satellite tracker from here. Um, and so uh, he wasn't able to scuttle the boat. He wasn't allowed to scuttle the boat. Um, that story's just broken in the last uh, in the last hour. Uh, you know, we knew he didn't scuttle it, but prior to now, we were only able to say that uh, it was he was advised under instruction not to scuttle it. But it was uh, because it's a sensitive maritime park, it would breach uh, international law. Okay. I, I never heard of that. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, there are some parts of the world where, you, yeah, it, because it's right next to St. Paul, I believe. I haven't looked at the legislation, but I, it might be that it's uh, St. Paul and uh, Amsterdam Island. They often create a, 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 a marine reserve around those areas, like a sensitive area. Uh, it's a special zone, and it could be that could be part of what it is. I'm not sure. What were the sea depths around the – the area of the storm was was it a pretty deep water or was it pretty shallow? Uh, actually, to tell you the truth, I haven't looked. It's typical Southern Ocean. The storm was about a thousand, about 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 well, no, about eight hundred miles across um, in total impact. But the intense part was only about uh, two hundred miles, uh, something like that, two three hundred miles. Um, but I haven't looked at the depths. I haven't got there. But it's, there's no particular navigation hazard there, like in, in depth of you know, sudden changes, sea mounts, and things like that. The, the, you know, I, we watched this storm grow, we, and I spent th over three and a half years in the Southern Ocean and, and uh, over the last 20 years, and I uh, deal a lot in the Southern Ocean every every summer, all that stuff down there. Um, we watched this storm for, for three days, and we tried to get the fleet into a safe position for it. We thought it was just a normal 
Southern Ocean gale coming. And as it turned out, it turned into one of the worst types that you can possibly experience in the Southern Ocean. It's like a mini typhoon, you know, where it folded around them. You know, we told them to go south to get below this area of high wind. And then all of a sudden, the whole thing closed around them. But it had a perfect calm zone right down the middle from the centre of it right going south. And on one side, you had 50, 60 knot northerlies. And on the other side, you had 70 knot southerlies. And the whole system was moving incredibly fast. And so it creates a very dangerous and chaotic sea. And I did a live uh, Facebook post four hours before they all got into trouble. And I was saying, this is really dangerous. This is extreme. It's going to create and set up a sea state which will be incredibly dangerous. And that's exactly what happened. Um, so they're not uncommon, but they're not usual. You know, it's not your typical, everyone says Southern Ocean and, and it's... Um, you know, you get big seas and big seas. I've been down there in 23 metre seas and 70, 75 knot winds, and it's sort of manageable. You have big swells, you know, they're in big lines, and you've you got all this wind that's hard to breathe. But, you know, that's when you set your boat up and you manage it. When it gets chaotic, you can't do anything, you know, you, or you can, you try, but it's just all over the place. You know, there's no consistency. It's changing all the time, and, and it's very dangerous, and that's what happened. And, the only one that survived it was Mark Slats, and uh, he was terrified. He'd been down there before. Um, he got knocked down twice in 15 knots of breeze in the middle in that calm spot because the seas were still 15 metres. And uh, he was washed out of the cockpit at one point, managed to stay on board. One wave, he didn't see it because he was down below with the storm board on, but he knew what happened. It just it, it rolled over and broke into the back of the boat. And it just exploded the companionway, right? The whole companionway burst burst through, flooded the boat down below. He had 60 centimetres of water over the floorboards, like right up past the, the settee berths. So the boat's half full of water. And, um, you know, he had to struggle. You know, he was terrified. Uh, but he survived. So, um, so that was okay. And he was also uh, thrown overboard, right? Yeah, he was in the cockpit hand steering in about 60, 70 knots and, uh, in, the, in the beginning because uh, he was trying to work out how to set the boat up and the steering lines on the Aries had, had a problem. And and, uh, and then he got knocked down pretty badly. He went out the side, bent the staunch and got back on board, managed to somehow repair the steering lines and got the Aries going again and uh, uh, you know kept at it. But he was wearing a harness. That was part of the reason why he didn't get washed overboard. Yeah, exactly. Oh, you would? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he's wearing his harness. So. Um, what's the source for the the reports of a 15 meter sea and a 70 knot storm? Where's is that uh, from the weather reports? Is that from the observations of the the skippers? Uh, both. Um, we're using Windy Ty for all our weather forecasting. It's an active, an active real-time overlay over the tracking, the GGR tracking site. Okay, so you can overlay the real-time windy TY weather, and it shows you very graphically what to expect, and you can forward forecast that up to seven days. Okay, and so the forecasting was showing forecast winds of over 60 knots, and in any weather report you get from any bureau around the world, if you you have to add 25 to 30 percent for the gusts. Okay, so if you forecast 60 knots, you know you're going to get 75 knots and more. And so, Mark, uh, and then you can determine the sea state as well. The the scale on the sea state on Windy Ty on our GTR tracker um, only goes to nine meters. It doesn't go any higher. And of course, it was showing nine meters, but you can actually tell then when you're going past the 70 knots of breeze, it'll go up. So I was predicting 14 meter seas, um, you know. And Mark Slats uh, has. You know, he's been around. He's already done seeing navigation and all over. Uh, he was he came back and said, yeah, they were easily 15 metres. Um, you know, Gregor was saying something similar. You know, he was saying sort of, you know, 13, 14 metres. Um, haven't spoken to Tommy yet. But, you know, and they were dangerous seas. It's never the size. It's always the shape. You know, you can have a 10 metre sea, an 8 metre sea, 7 metre sea. If it's a dangerous sea, you're in real trouble, you know. Okay. And uh, so there's... Only eight skippers left in the Golden Globe race proper. And yeah. so I think a lot of skippers thought that this was a race uh, about going fastest. Uh, is it really a race about just finishing? 
I, I think, uh, you know, my attitude is that when the race started, out of the 17 starters, there was probably, uh, there was probably um, four or five that were racing right from the very beginning. The others saw it really as a, you know, you've got to finish. They, they didn't care where the race was. They wanted to perform well, but it was all about getting around. And all of the ones that were racing, those four or five that I would call, they had an objective to win the race. They're very mindful that you've got to finish. So I don't think anyone has been sailing recklessly at all. Um, certainly some made equipment decisions and, and uh uh, so on with their boats like furling gear, no furling gear, lightweight, heavyweight, all these sorts of decisions had a, had an interplay on the reason why some entrants ended up retiring. Equipment failure, uh, you know, too hard, things like that. When conditions get tough, they all stop racing and it's all about surviving. You know, you stop racing, you just make sure you're going to survive this storm and then when it's over, you get back racing again, you know. So I think all of them are doing that. About how far along would you say that uh, we, the majority of the fleet is? Is it about third of the way through, or about half the way through? No, they're, they're passing a third of the way now. You okay. know, they're, you know, in the next in the next week, they've all gone. All of them will be past a third. Uh, Jean Luc will be into uh, Hobart on the third or fourth, and uh, he'll be halfway. You know, Hobart is definitely the halfway point. And from there, we, we're suggesting that, uh, you know, the worst, everyone thinks around the world, oh, Cape Horn, you know, Southern Ocean, da 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 that's not the case at all. Um, I've been saying for years and years that the worst part in any circumnavigation is always the Indian Ocean. Um, the weather there is the most unstable. Um, usually it's uh, the entrance is settling down. Uh, you know, the, the, that's always where, you know, I've been predicting we'll have challenges, and, and we have. Uh, I'll be very happy when all the sailors get to Hobart, you know, uh, after that. Uh, I mean, it's never easy, but certainly the Indian Ocean uh, has its serious challenges. You know. And I noticed that they're not allowed to go below 42 south in the Indian Ocean. Uh, what's the reason for that? Well, it's very easy. If you get onto Windy TY pretty much any day of the week and look at where the heavier winds are, you'll find that they're below 40 degrees south. Um, so the idea is to keep them up high, to keep them out of the worst of the weather. Otherwise, they'll be continually bombarded by extreme, you know, extreme weather, you know, huge winds, huge seas, all that sort of stuff. So it's a, it's a safety feature, and we lifted it from 44 to 42. Uh, the boats entered the Southern Ocean about two weeks earlier than we projected, um, and uh, we thought that's a prudent thing to do. And uh, that, that, that's the case. You know, you can't go too high. You get headwinds all the time. But um, but it's working out okay now, and, and uh, uh, you'll see, you know, any time you look at the track, and you'll see, especially when storms are coming through, the majority of it usually is below 40, you know, 40 south. All right. Well, thanks for talking to me. I uh, appreciate it. I think you guys did a great job in this uh, latest uh, Code Red, and I'm sure we're going to hear a lot more interesting stories from you guys in the coming months. Yeah, cool. Good to chat. Okay. No bye okay. Bye. Thanks, man. Yep. Bye bye. Subscribe to Slow Boat Sailing to get ripped from the headlines stories about the most interesting sailors in the world and our round the world adventure. Mantis aimed to design the most reliable anchor ever made. Other anchors often cannot set in firm or grassy bottoms, endangering your safety. The Mantis frequently sets the first time even in the most demanding situations. We sleep a lot easier using the Mantis anchor as our primary on the slow boat. Get yours at mantisanchors.com or other fine retailers.